You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 27, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Severe Combined Immunodeficiency, Past, Present, and Future. Our presenter is Dr. Eyal Grunbaum. He's a professor of immunology and pediatrics at the University of Toronto in the Division of Immunology and Allergy, and he's a senior scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. Um, So welcome to conferences on online allergy today, everyone, Um, August 27th, 2021. Today for our first speaker, um, we are pleased to have Dr. Grunbaum join us. He is a professor of immunology and pediatrics at the University of Toronto in the Division of Immunology and Allergy and is a senior scientist um, and in the developmental and stem cell biology program at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. Um, Today he's going to be presenting on severe combined immunodeficiency, the past, present, and future. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Grunbaum. It's all, uh, the time's all yours. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction and uh, uh, for the uh, pleasure to speak with you today. Um, I will jump in into my educational objectives today, which are to describe some of the classical clinical and laboratory features of severe combined immune deficiency and help you recognize the changes that newborn screening for severe combined immune deficiency have had on our practice. I'll also discuss some of the advances in the management of severe combined immune deficiency, and I'll use a few uh, illustrative cases to demonstrate my uh, other points. So the first patient I want to describe was referred to me in 2007. He was four months old and suffered from micartatitis, had an episode of X-ray pneumonia as well as intermittent diarrhea, and was failing to thrive. He was the first child of a non-consanguineous Chinese-Mexican parents with a family history that was significant for a maternal uncle that died in infancy in Mexico. Physical examination revealed that he was cachectic and dyspneic. He had all thrush and no lymph nodes or tonsils. So definitely the history and physical examination provided important information with quite a few red flags that should make one consider at least the possibility of a profound immune deficiency. Chest X-ray showed bilateral b basilar infiltrates. And in contrast to the prominent thymus that you can see here um, in a normal child, our patient did not have a thymus. Uh, This was later confirmed by an ultrasound of the chest, which is really the preferred modality to assess the presence and size of a thymus. Laboratory investigations demonstrated that his CBC, including neutrophil numbers and platelets, were normal. He he did have marked lymphopenia um, at about 1,000 cells per microliter. His IgG was low, but present although at this age it might still have reflected maternal IgG that caused the placenta. An important clue here was that IgM and IgA, which I would have expected to be increased given his history of infections, were actually quite low. Other critical clues uh, were the identification of CMV in his blood, as well as new Cystis gyrovecci in this bronchial alveolar lavage, which is practically pathognomonic for a severe T-cell dysfunction. When the diagnosis of a profound T-cell deficiency is established, it's very important to eliminate secondary causes. These include infections such as HIV and other severe uh, complications, medications, as well as medications that the mother and child might have received, malignancies, secondary loss, etc. Some of the congenital defects or even severe sepsis or major surgeries in the neonatal period can also lead to very low lymphocyte number and dysfunction. 
So really, a good history and investigation is required. But in our patient, we did not find evidence for any of these secondary etiologies, leading us to suspect that the patient had a severe immune deficiency. The next step that we took was to assess the patient's lymphocyte subsets using flow cytometry. Very briefly, in the flow cytometry, cells are incubated with fluorescent antibodies that recognize specific surface or intracellular markers and proteins. The cells are then run through a flow cytometer that uses variety of color lasers to count the number of fluorescent events, eventually giving us this histogram that we can then, using percentages, uh, calculate back the number of cells that the patient might have. In our patient, flow cytometry demonstrated that he had practically no T cells or natural killer cells, while his B cells numbers were normal. He also had no naive T cells that typically express CD45 RA. Finally, the few T cells that were present did not respond to stimulation with fetohemagglutinin or anti-CD3 stimulation. All of these values led us to make the diagnosis that he had severe combined immune deficiency in what we would characterize as T minus B plus NK minus skid. Now, this plus and minus nomenclature, which is derived from the lymphocyte immunophenotyping, is very important as it provides a, at least a preliminary clue to the molecular diagnosis of the severe immune defect. For example, absence of T minus absence of uh, T cells with normal B and NK lymphocytes, we would designate as T minus B plus NK plus, and it is common among patients with defects in the CD3 chains, I7 receptor alpha deficiency, DGOR syndrome, and others. In contrast, T minus B plus NK minus skid is often caused by mutations in the gamma common chain or JAK3 deficiency. This is only a partial list on this uh, slide, uh, and for those who are interested, more details can be found in the recent uh, Journal of Clinical Immunology Manuscript, and I provided the reference below. Um, however, I do need to caution you that uh, there are many uh, instances where there is discordancy between the phenotype and genotype. So it's only a preliminary clue to what we would be looking for. In our patient, the T minus B plus NK minus immunophenotyping suggested either a defect in the IL2 receptor gamma or JAK3 uh, uh, signaling molecule. And sequencing of these genes indeed eventually revealed that the defect was in the gamma common chain. The name gamma common chain comes from the fact that the same chain is required for signaling through several cytokine receptors, as you can see here, um, including the IL-2 and IL-4 receptors that are important for T cells, and the IL-15 receptor that is important for NK cell development explaining why the phenotype in our patient was that where both T cells and natural killer cells were affected. You can also see from this cartoon that all of these receptor, receptors signal through the JAK3 molecule, which is why defects in the gamma common chain and, and uh, JAK3 lead to a practically identical phenotype. The gene encoding for the gamma common chain is on the X chromosome, which is why males are affected and females are carriers, explaining, at least in our, in our patient, the, uh, the fact that he had a maternal uncle that likely died from the same condition in infancy. So this is an X-linked recessive condition that is also known as SCID-X1 
it is the most common cause of severe combined immune deficiency in North America, as described in this pie chart, uh, pie graph from Jennifer Huck's recent publication on severe combined immune deficiency. I can't emphasize enough that such presentation of skin, as in our baby, is a true medical emergency. I must say this is one of the few cases that I really emphasize to our trainees that they should call me even if it's the middle of the night. It is critical to start supportive treatment for these babies as soon as possible because they may crash on you at any moment. It's important to look for and treat their infections. There are even centers that routinely do blood hall viral lavage on such patients to look for pneumocystis gyroveschi pneumonia. It's also very important to prevent infections by minimizing exposure to potential pathogens. So our patient was admitted into the immunology reverse isolation unit in the hospital. We started him on immunoglobulin infusions and PJP treatment. Some places also add fungal and CMV prophylaxis, which we don't, but many other centers do. And I do want to emphasize CMV because it's one of our biggest nemesis, as it can uh, um, be also, it can cause a devastating neurological damage to these patients, which often has a very severe long-term consequences on their health. Uh, CMV can also be passed by maternal breast milk, so sometimes we even ask mothers to avoid breastfeeding, something that I'll, I'll touch upon uh, later on in the talk. In addition, most of these ba babies are failing to fly and require calorie supplementation, either by NG tube feeding or even total parental nutrition. Altogether, these are very complex patients and are sick that require a multidisciplinary team approach just to stabilize their condition. And that often falls on the shoulders uh, of the immunology allergy team. So be prepared. Yet all of these are only temporary measures. What the kids really need is a new immune system. To replace the immune system while stabilizing the patient, it is really important to identify a potential HLA-matched allogeneic donor that could be used for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. This should be done as quickly as possible, as there have been times that we rushed to transplant and were able to perform it within one to two weeks of diagnosis. So really, every day here counts. Coming back to our patient, he had difficult to control uh, CMV and PJP pneumonia, and it took us quite some time to uh, get them uh, under control. We also could not find an HLA matched unrelated donor due to the family's unique mixed ethnicity. So eventually we elected to use his haplo, half identical father, um, haplo identical, HLA haplo identical father meaning that the father shared only 50% of the patient's HLA. Because of this HLA disparity, we had to remove the T cells from the dad's blood, so the dad's immune cells would not mount a response that we call graft versus whole disease against the recipient, his son. Because the patient had no functional T cells or natural killer cells, and was quite sick at the time of transplant, we did not use any chemotherapy condition. The avoidance of, chemo of chemotherapy in such patients was in according to a landmark paper published several years earlier by Dr. Rebecca Buckley and the Duke team uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Despite the T cell depletion, the patient suffered from severe graft versus host disease that involved the gastrointestinal tract, the liver, and the skin, and required prolonged treatment with steroids and cyclosporin. 
Even more disturbing was the fact that the patient did not maintain the donor T cells, and a year later, he had to have a second transplant. We again used his dad as a donor. However, this time, we did add myeloblation. Indeed, in a large international study that we conducted, we found that uh, uh, up to 30% of patients who received transplants from their parents tended to fail in Gaffney, um, which led us in subsequent years to try and avoid as much as possible the use of HLA haploidentical transplants. Eventually, he pulled through, and we continued to follow him on a yearly basis. And except for difficult to manage wars, he does not suffer from any significant infections. He does have persistent lung damage, possibly because of his initial pneumocystis gyrovechi pneumonia, as well as hearing impairment from the CMV and cataracts from the steroids. He is an A student and functions completely normal. Evaluation of his immune system showed that he has mixed donor chimerism, where all his T cells are from the donor, but 50% of, of his B cells are still original or, uh, from the patient himself. Nevertheless, this is sufficient to produce nor normal immunoglobulins, and he mounts a, an appropriate antibody response to all the vaccines that he received. So altogether, I think we were able to do good with this patient. But that was uh, 2007. I want to share with you another patient that was referred to me 10 years later. This was a 10-day-old male infant that was referred to us when he was actually symptomatic. He was sent to us because he had a normal result in his skid newborn screening essay. Newborn screening for skids was introduced in Ontario, in our province, in 2013, following a very successful launch in the United States, and is based on an essay called TREC essay, T-cell receptor excision circle. The TREC um, essay is based on the fact that when the T-cell receptor is rearranged, pieces of DNA need to be excised to achieve approximation of the VDJ gene segments. These excised fragments tend to form circles, and I won't go into why they do that, but these circles are resistant to degradation and stay within the thymocytes as these cells leave the thymus. Importantly, they can be detected in the peripheral blood. So instead of counting T cells, uh, for example, by flow cytometry, we can measure the, these T-cell receptor excision circles by PCR as a surrogate marker for the T-cell production by the thymus. Dr. Jennifer Pop, together with Dr. Daniel Duick and others, figured in the early 2000s that they could extract DNA from these from gut recards that are done routinely on babies and establish uh, a way to assess albeit indirectly, the number of T cells in the infants. This essay gained popularity because it's easy to perform, cheap, it costs only a few bucks to run, and is very quick, where results can come back the same day or the following day. Absence of TREC is practically pathognomonic for severe combined immune deficiency although interpretation of low TREC numbers is a little more complicated. This is in part because the cutoff values changes from one center to another, which influences the sensitivity and specificity of the essay. Also, there are several known causes for what I would call, and you can't see um, my hand waving, but it's what I would call false, false positive. That is, infants that the TREC will get better over time. This is often caused by prematurity or sepsis. In contrast, there are also, quote-unquote, true false positive results, i.e., infants that will have persistently low TRECs but are not caused by severe combined immune deficiency. 
These conditions include 22Q11 microdeletion, Down syndrome, ataxic ataxia, and a growing list of other diseases. And if someone is interested to learn more about the PREC essay performance in real life, uh, there's a very good paper summarizing the experience in California um, that I recommend reading, and I provided the reference down here. So for your uh, uh, for those who are interested, it is also important that the PREC essay is only a screening test and has false negative components. It may miss certain forms of severe immune defects, such as MAC class 2 deficiency, some adenosine DNAs deficient patients, and others. So you need to keep being vigilant as kid patients may still present later in life and not be picked up by newborn screening. Yet, there is no doubt that the introduction of newborn screening for severe combined immune deficiency has had a tremendous impact on the management of these babies. Indeed, in North America, most skin patients are now identified through newborn screening, as seen in this publication from the PIDTC. FYI, just because I'm going to mention it several times throughout my talk, PIDTC stands for a Primary Immune Deficiency Treatment Consortium, which is the leading North American consortium of immunologists and transplanters focused on the management of patients with inherited areas of immunity. It includes almost 50 academic centers from the U.S. and Canada, so its data is considered uh, quite reliable and comprehensive. Going back to our patient, the flow cytometry demonstrated reduced numbers of T cells although not as low as the first patient that I presented. He did have normal numbers of B cells and natural killer cells. He had no naive T cells, and the few T cells that he did have in his peripheral blood did not respond to stimulation. So, after excluding secondary causes for immune deficiency, and I won't repeat that list again, he was diagnosed as suffering from a T minus B plus and K plus skid. Over the years, our practice have, ch have changed, and rather than isolating kids in the hospital, which is quite a burden to the families and to the medical system, we often now keep them, these infants, with skid at home until the transplant. Obviously, unless they have complications or risk factors. So, while looking for a stem cell donor for this patient, we followed the baby closely with frequent clinic visits. We monitored him with weekly CBCs, LFTs, as well as measuring his viral PCR load for CMV. Mother was CMV IgG negative, so we did allow him to continue on breastfeeding. We also initiated IVAG and PJP prophylaxis. Unfortunately, when he came for his IVAG infusion at four weeks of age, we noticed that he had stuffy nose and cough. His oxygen, oxygen saturation was also um, uh, declining. NP swabs showed that he caught paraflu type 3, probably from his mom. And so he was admitted to the hospital. Within three days, we observed the appearance of a diffuse macropapular rash that became bright red, uh, like a sunburn. Additionally, he developed uh, cervical and axillary lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly. This was accompanied by a uh, derangement of his liver enzymes, an appearance of eosinophilia um, and uh, uh, elevated IgE and lymphocytosis in his peripheral blood. Repeated blow, uh, flow cytometry indicated increase in his T cells involving both CD4 and CD8 positive cells. Further analysis of his uh, T cell receptor repertoire showed clonal expansion of the patient's cells, shown here in blue. Um, and analyzing the X and Y chromosomes in the patient's T cells, 
show that he did not have maternal engraftment, maternal T-cell engraftment. So all of these cells, including all of these T-cells, were really from the patient. And this led us to the diagnosis of, co of a complication called Owen syndrome. Owen syndrome is estimated to occur in about 10% of patients with profound T-cell immune deficiency. It's characterized by uh, exfoliative erythroderma, alopecia, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, chronic diarrhea, and failure to thrive. It is often caused by hypomorphic mutations in RAG1 or RAG2 genes. It can be associated with practically any profound T-cell immune deficiency that still allows generation of some T-cells. There's still a debate about the exact mechanism for Omen syndrome. Yet the current consensus is that it is due to failure of central or peripheral immune tolerance that enables expansion of clone, oligoclonal T cells in the periphery, which contribute to an uncontrolled inflammation in the tissues. Management of Omen syndrome is difficult and counterintuitive. Although dealing with children with severe immune deficiency, the treatment actually requires further immune suppression with systemic steroids or cytosporine. Some have even tried to use an mTOR inhibitor, such as serolimus, to, provide, to promote regulatory T cells. We and the family were obviously very disappointed by the parainfluenza infection that the infant caught despite the early identification of skin. However, um, this is actually quite common. Among the patients enrolled in the PADTC prospective study, 59% of the patients identified by newer screening actually suffered from infections prior to transplant. And similar to our patient, most of these infections were predominantly respiratory uh, uh, were due primarily to respiratory viruses. There were also a few who developed CMV and EBV. It's definitely something that we and others see despite the newborn screening uh, success. As we were preparing for transplant, we received the results of the genetic testing done to identify the cause of the skid and omen in our patient. As mentioned earlier, the differential diagnosis of T minus, B plus, NK plus is wider and includes defects in the IL-7 receptor as well as the CD3 chain. It also includes defects in the thymus itself, which are very important to identify, something that I will expand on later. In our patient, he actually was found to have B allelic mutations in the CD3 delta chain. The delta chain, which you can see here, um, is um, part of the CD3 complex and is critical for activation of T cells, as well as the recru recruitment of intracellular signaling molecules such as ZAP70. And without the CD3 delta uh, chain, T cells cannot function. At two months of age, our patient uh, received an HLA-matched unrelated core blood transplant. Because of the Omen syndrome and the use of core blood, which is often associated with graft rejection, we added antithymocyte globulin to the prepar preparatory chemotherapy regimen that the patient received prior to transplant. Still, he suffered from severe graft versus host disease of the skin, liver, and gastrointestinal tract possibly because of the pre-existing inflammation in these tissues that led to exposure of antigens, changing the microbiome, uh, flora, and other factors, as described in this excellent review in Frontiers of Immunology of the Pathophysiology of graft versus heart disease. Again, I won't go too much into the pathophysiology, uh, as this is a really a great review for those who are interested and reading more. We were quite concerned about this transplant 
as survival is significantly reduced by the presence of infections and the use of core blood transplants in patients with severe combined immune deficiency. A landmark paper from the Primary Immune Deficiency Treatment Consortium that looked at 100 skin patients demonstrated that survival was significantly reduced uh, if patients had an active infection at the time of transplant. Moreover, as you can see here, the use of cord blood was associated with the lowest survival. Nevertheless, cord blood was the best match that we could find for this patient, so we elected to proceed with it. Indeed, our patient had a rocky course, yet eventually he pulled through, and now, four years later, he's doing quite well. So, some interim conclusions from these first two patients. Outcome of severe combined immune deficiency depends on early diagnosis and transplantation prior to the development of infections and other complications. Yet there are clearly some room for improvement, which leads me to the third part of my talk and the third patient. So now this is really the future. Uh, it's the summer of 2027, and I've just returned from a vacation from a maskless resort after receiving my mRNA vaccine targeting the Zeta COVID vaccine, COVID strain. After uh, coming back, uh, a five-day-old female infant is referred to me because of abnormal newborn screening for PID. The PID screening includes TREC, as done previously, as well as something called CREC, or as I like calling them, BREC. CREC stands for Kappa Chain Receptor Excision Circle and is the equivalent of TREC, except it assesses B cells. Just a quick reminder, the Kappa Chain is one of the two light chains that is conjugated to the heavy chain on the B cells. The advantage of adding CREC to the newborn screening is that in addition to identifying patients with absent B cells, such as A gamma globulinemia, it improves the ability to pick on patients with combined immune deficiencies, such as P, uh, PNP deficiency or partial ADA deficiency, DOC8, ataxia nausea, etc. It is already being piloted in some countries, um, and uh, I do anticipate that because the technology will become so cheap, it will be implemented worldwide by 2027. Moreover, there will be a few reflex testing that will be done automatically on abnormal skid uh, uh, um, gut records, including the analysis of proven metabolites for ADA and PNP deficiency, specific gene mutations uh, in certain areas, and uh, next-generation sequencing for rapid gene defects. For example, tandem mass spectrometry piping will be done on the original Guthrie cards, um, and this is a, have already been implemented in Ontario to uh, allow quick detection of ADA deficiency with, um, because we have a high proportion of ADA deficient in our area. It's very important to identify these patients quick uh, so we can start enzyme replacement therapy with PEG-ADA uh, before they have irreversible brain damage. In Ontario, for example, we also have a high proportion of patients with ZAP70 and CD3 delta deficiency because of the Mennonite population. So every abnormal track result in Western Ontario triggers analysis for these two gene mutations. I should also point out that analysis of common gene defects has been piloted for some severe primary immune deficiency, even with normal TREC. For example, screening for I kappa B kappa B deficiency is now being done in Manitoba. Another interesting development that was recently developed, uh, reported from Norway is uh, that they now screen all their newborns for a panel of uh, a wide array of uh, uh, severe immune deficiencies and have been able to pick uh, quite a few newborns very early in life, which 
uh, is much quicker than what we're able to do today. So clearly, uh, there are uh, advantages in doing uh, wider newborn screening. There are also some challenges, the cost, the data processing, false positivity, uh, confidentiality. But I do anticipate that by 2027, in five years from now or so, these will be sorted out. Uh, sometimes, despite all our attempts, we fail to diagnose the cause of a profound T-cell immune deficiency. And we don't know whether or not we should proceed for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. I do want to emphasize that because, um, um, and the analogy that I often use to explain it to our trainees is that when we don't see good uh, students coming out of the school, in most cases, it's, it's because the students aren't entering the school, but um, it might also be because the problem is with the school itself, i.e. the thymus itself is the problem. A classic example is the George syndrome caused by 22Q11 microdeletion. However, in recent years, we're identifying more and more thymic stroma defects. And so, um, uh, in these patients, replacing the students or supplying good new students will not solve the issue. They actually need a thymic transplant. And over the last uh, uh, few uh, uh, decades, thymic transplants have been explored and offered in the, uh, in the U.S. At, in Duke. So it is important to identify these patients because they should be referred to thymic transplant rather than a bone marrow transplant. And in this picture is actually one of my patients who was referred to a thymic transplant and not instead of a uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So it's easy to do when we can identify the, the mutation, but what can we do when the defect is not known? So one potential answer is to tie and go the patient's hematopoietic stem cells in our test tube into T cells um, that in a way that we could simulate thymic development. Recently, Dr. Eli Haddad's group from Montreal and Gigi Notrangelo's from the uh, NIH were able to take the patient's peripheral blood or bone marrow, extract CD34 positive stem cells, and grow them in three-dimensional tissue cultures into T cells. And if the T cells develop normally, then it actually indicates that the thymus is the problem. And these kids would, would benefit from a thymus transplant. If, on the other hand, the cells do not grow normally, if the patient cells do not grow normally, then the issue, the problem, is with the stem cells. And these patients would benefit from a bone marrow transplant. These artificial thymic organoids also provide a great opportunity to study the effects of different mutations of thymocyte development. Yet that's for another uh, talk. Nevertheless, uh, I'm almost certain that in five years from now, this will be done on almost any patient where we don't have a clear diagnosis for the etiology of the severe combined immune deficiency. Um, the changes in diagnosis and practice seem to have already made a difference. In this paper from the PADTC, um, which I already mentioned earlier, you can see that the survival of patients transplanted without infection uh, has now gone up to almost 95% with practically all types of donors used except for umbilical cord transplant. So definitely by 2027, most of our patients should be up here. Going back to, our pa to my patient, the reflex next generation sequencing in her identified a B allelic mutation in a gene called DCLRE1C that causes Artemis deficiency. Flow cytometry demonstrated as expected absence of B and T cells in her while sparing the NK cells. 
And that is because Artemis participates in VDJ recombination, which are critical for TNB cell development, but not for natural killer cell development. Establishing this diagnosis was very important because Artemis deficiency causes an increased DNA break in cells following damage to cells by radiation or chemotherapy. This might contribute to the increased lay toxicity that we've seen with patients with Artemis following transplantation. Uh, so indeed now many centers use in reduced intensity conditioning when transplanting patients with Artemis and other DNA breakage syndrome. So by 2027, allogeneic transplants for patients with severe mean deficiency will be performed differently. We will use minimum amount of conditioning that will be tailored for each one, each patient, and each disease. This is already being investigated with the first prospective study from the Primary Immune Deficiency Treatment Consortium where we're randomizing patients to receive different amounts of low dose of a chemotherapy called busulfide. Also, several groups are investigating myeloablative regimens that are based on monoclonal antibodies, specifically targeting bone marrow progenitors that are not chemotherapy, thereby avoiding the adverse effects associated with chemotherapy. Yet the biggest challenge in transplants for severe combined with new deficiency still remains uh, graft versus host disease. So one of the ways to avoid that is by doing uh, autologous gene-corrected hematopoietic stem cell transplants, or what we commonly refer to as gene therapy. How is this done? Well, we take the uh, patient's hematopoietic stem cells, either from the bone marrow or peripheral blood, and use a non-replicating uh, virus to introduce a gene, our gene of interest in the patient's cells ex vivo, and then inject back the modified cells into the patient that is conditioned with a minimum amount of chemotherapy. There are obvious advantages to gene therapy, especially for primary immune deficiency, um, and I mentioned the uh, avoidance of GAP versus host disease. It also allows us to uh, avoid uh, potential infectious, infectious exposures from the donor, and it allows us to insert additional genes that we might want to at the same time. There are also some disadvantages to gene therapy that is important to remember. Uh, one is that we need to know the genetic defect, so it cannot be done for uh, conditions where we still don't know the cause. Um, it cannot be done if the patient's uh, stem cells uh, quality is compromised because the patient is too sick or is suffering from a genetic defect that also affects his uh, uh, stem cells. Um, it's uh, challenging to do with very small donors as the amount of cells that we can harvest is relatively limited and it also uh, is limited by the time that um, takes to produce sufficient numbers of manip manipulated cells. Nevertheless, this is quite an attractive option, and there are increasing number uh, of uh, conditions where we are now doing these uh, types of uh, uh, gene therapy. So some of the landmarks in gene therapy for primary immune deficiency uh, they began in the early 1990s. Actually, the first gene therapy for human disease was done for an immune deficiency. That was ADA deficiency. The initial uh, gene therapy ties failed to achieve long-term engraftment. Uh, it, was, it took almost 10 years until the next gene therapy tie was uh, investigated. That was for uh, the X-linked skid. Uh, I, caused by I2 receptor gamma deficiency. That was complicated by the development of leukemia in some of the patients, uh, which uh, taught us about insertional mutagenesis, the preferential uh, tendency of some viruses to integrate into trans 
uh, into transcriptionally active uh, sites such as oncogene, onco oncogenes in the genome. Um, but over the years, we've learned and found a way to deliver uh, genes in a much safer manner. We now use lentiviruses that have been proven to be safe and effective in delivery of genes. Uh, a recent publication, landmark publication, uh, demonstrated the safety and efficacy of uh, delivering the gamma C chain into patient CD34 selected bone marrow cells using such lentiviruses. Um, these patients have all done really, really well. And there are more and more such gene therapy trials that are being conducted for additional primary immune deficiencies such as ADA deficiency, which got to allergy syndrome, and chronic amelomatous disease. Even for Artemis, the condition that our patient is suffering from, there are now a gene therapy tie for Artemis. Uh, currently at the University of San Francisco, there's a phase one uh, tie of Artemis led by Dr. Cohen and Puck. Uh, currently, uh, there have been 10 patients treated by this uh, protocol, including seven infants, um, and they have all shown very promising results with the increase in the number of T and B cells and excellent T cell diversity and no clonal expansion. So I have no doubt that by 2027, this will be the standard of care. Moreover, in 2027, patients will not need to fly to California to get gene therapy. There are already successful results in cryopreserved hematopoietic stem cell uh, uh, cells that have been uh, transfused with lentiviruses. So the I, instead of sending the patient, we'll just, we'll just need to send the cells. So definitely significant changes by that year. Finally, I want to, in the next uh, two slides, to talk about what I think are the frontiers for gene therapy, and that is gene editing. Currently, what we're doing with gene therapy is we uh, randomly add a copy or a fragment of the gene of interest across the genome. The gene is not always properly regulated as the promoters and enhancers for that specific gene are not included. In recent years, a new technology has been uh, um, developed called CRISPR technology. So just to explain to you what are the potential uh, complications of gene therapy, I like to use this sentence where, where the normal read is the cat ate the rat in, um, and a gene defect causes the sentence to become the cat ate the hat, which obviously doesn't make sense. Um, when we do gene addition, which is what we currently are performing, we add the term uh, randomly across the sentence and we get something that reads like, the rat cat ate the hat. So obviously you can see why this still has some challenges in it. In contrast, in gene editing, we can actually replace just the abnormal read through making the sentence make sense again. The cat ate the rat. So over the last couple of years, development in technology has allowed delivery of uh, uh, genes using CRISPR-Cas9 and similar technologies to a precise location in the gene, across the genome. And I have no doubt that by 2027, this will be far more developed. There's still technological challenges with CRISPR in the delivery of large DNA cargo, as well as low efficacy and off-target effects. Although there are, as you might have heard, already some clinical ties that are already underway. So this is probably the future. So in conclusion, newborn screening has changed the presentation and management of severe combined immune deficiency. Earlier identification and better transplant technology 
has improved the outcome of patients with SCID in recent uh, years. Better diagnosis and management options are rapidly becoming a reality. And I think gene editing holds the greatest promise for patients with primary immune deficiency. I'll finish by acknowledging that taking care of patients with SCID is a real teamwork. Uh, it requires a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of frustration, but a lot of uh, satisfaction. And so now in the remaining few minutes, I'll be happy to take questions from the audience. Thank you for your, everyone for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Grunbaum. That was um, a really insightful lecture, and um, I appreci appreciated the kind of look towards the future. It's it just it gets me excited about um, what's around the corner and being able to help patients better. Um, so, anyone, um, if there are any questions, you can put them in the chat, or you can unmute and ask them. So let me ask the, the people on the call, uh, who has had experience with children going for gene therapy? Anyone? Um, I know we, we just sent one from here, um, from Children's Mercy. We sent, I don't know, I, somebody, one of the other fellows who... Um, was more involved might not remember where where they were sent to. Do you remember um, the etiology? Why was the patient sent for gene therapy? Um, I don't recall exactly because there were some there were some kind of weird genetic results um, that there was some discussion on. Do you remember, Hannah? Let me help you. Uh, this is Nikita. Oh, um, hey, Dr. Rajay. Perfect. Hey. Yes, you, uh, you would know better than anyone. We had two patients with common gamma chain uh, defect, and both were sent to St. Jude. Excellent. Okay. And, and uh, that was the uh, – might have been in the study quoted the New England Journal of Medicine. Indeed, I think St. Jude has uh, been able to push uh, – the concept of gene therapy for i to receptor gamma, and especially the, the use of low-dose busulfan, which uh, has been debatable for many, many years. But it clearly allows, uh, uh, it, it demonstrates the need to give the cells some survival advantage. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, so the first patient did really well. We are waiting on the results for the second one. So, um, yeah, we are happy yeah. with the results. And were these infants identified through newborn screening? That's correct, newborn yeah. screening. Real-life examples. Any other... Uh, from people on the call. Hi, Dr. Greenbaum. Um, my name is Sonia. I'm one of the first year fellows at CMH. Um, I just had a question um, with like the new therapy that's coming through with CRISPR. Um, you know, once that kind of becomes more standard of care, is there anything in the future once they go through the therapy that you have to watch from like a screening perspective, or are they increased for like future lymphomas or leukemias or that has nothing to do with the therapy? So it's an excellent question. And uh, what we've learned that uh, there's always a risk for lymphoma in these patients. Now, whether it's due to the um, gene itself or the gene manipulation uh, or a combination of them uh, is, uh, you know, people argue for either or both. 
But uh, just recently, a patient who received ADA deficiency, received gene therapy for ADA deficiency, after the first, um, I'd say close to 50 patients across the world, or maybe even 70 patients across the world, was seeing gene therapy for ADA deficiency. The first description of lymphoma uh, uh, emerged. So I think these patients should continue on to be followed very closely. We are manipulating their genes, and as even though, even if it's only a one in a hundred chance or a one in fifty chance that the gene will in, will disrupt an oncogene, I think it's still there. And so the answer is yes, these patients should be monitored very closely. And I don't think we will ever be able to say that it's not, that it's without any risk. Which leads me to uh, a point that, I, uh, that I've learned over the years. You know, 20 years ago, uh, we, I used to talk about curing an immune deficiency or curing patients. We don't. There's always the potential of complications. And so many families uh, understand that we're correcting the defect, but we're not curing the disease. It's not, we don't, it doesn't go away. We might replace it with something else, same as we do with bone marrow transplant. Something else that is much easier to control, much safer, um, but it's still there. So uh, just keep that in mind with your patients. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, no, that was really perfect. Thank you. And I guess my other question is, I'm, I'm internal medicine trained, so in residency, we kind of had very limited exposure to CAR-T therapy in, um, like, lymphoma patients, leukemia patients. Does this have any relation to that, or is that this therapy, like, uh, offshoot of that? I'm just trying to, like, organize it in my head. Um, so the car uh, um, the CART therapy um, is not the same as what we're doing. Here, we're taking the patient's cells and collecting one gene, actually a portion of the gene. In CART T cells, they actually introduce a either CD20 or CD19 uh, molecule that will be expressed on the patient's cells so it uh, uh, recognizes the tumor cells. So uh, the concept of introducing genes into the cells is the same, but the purposes, the technology, the, the goals are completely different. CAR T cells is usually a very time-limited effect and the cells disappear while uh, in gene therapy that we do, and I'll try and get that quickly to that slide that I put on, uh, it's we want the cell to actually, these cells to actually persist lifelong, which is why we're targeting stem cells and not peripheral T cells. So CAR T, the T stands for T cells, while we're doing stem cells. Was that? Yes, that was awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate that. All right. Well, I think that we are to our time limit, um, and I see that we have um, Dr. Atkinson joined us. So, um, again, on behalf of everyone, thank you, Dr. Grunbaum, for joining thank us you today. We, have a nice we have, Thank you so much. Oh, safe. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, we need it.